Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of the lecture on sequential circuits. In the previous part, we already had seen what the sequential logic is indeed, some properties of it, and also we get introduced to the storage elements, which are the latches. We have seen the SR latch, not S not R latch, and also the D type latch. In this lecture, we will see or we will learn about the Philip Phillips. And we see the difference between the Philip Phillips and the latches. So first we will see a problem which is which you will face when working with the latches, which is called as the latch timing problem. And then we will see the edge triggered flip flops and discuss about the direct inputs to the flip flops. Alright, so as we already know, latches are circuit elements which can store a state. We can set a latch to a value either 0 or 1, so you can set it or reset it, and then we can put the latch in the same value to hold the current value or to hold the previous value. When we want to do the complicated computations, we need to hold the intermediate state, but we also need to have various steps of the computation being coordinated. So we don't want to have uh, different steps taking place at different times. Yeah? We need to have a kind of coordination between the steps of the computation. How can we do this coordination between <laughs> coordination of the steps? Indeed, we can introduce a clocking mechanism. So if we have a clocking mechanism at rising edge of the clock or at falling edge of the clock, we can have all the steps being performed. And you should know how we can introduce the clock into the latches. We just did it in the previous part of the lecture. For the clocked D type, we know that clock could be used as a uh, as a separate input in it into the latch. But let's see how it will work in practice if we can use the latches with the clock input. If you consider the circuit given here, we have the clocked D latch, so we have one input clock, we have one input D, which is the, the data input, and we have two outputs, Q and not Q. So in the tier we have not Q. Uh, then, as you can see, the output, the second output of the latch, which is not Q, is connected to the data input of the latch. So we have a feedback here. The main output is called Y. We can also say that here we have not Y because we know that the two outputs of the latch are complement of each other. And we can assume that initially Y is equal to zero. So now let's see what happens when we receive the clock. So when clock is equal to zero or as far as the clock is equal to zero, the output will not change. But once clock becomes equal to one, when clock becomes equal to 1, since initially y was equal to 0, we had 0 here, therefore not y was equal to 1, and it was here at the input side of the latch. As clock becomes equal to 1, that input, the data input which is equal to 1, will be written into the, the latch, so the state of the latch will be updated, and therefore it will become 1 as well. But when the output y becomes equal to 1, the, the other output of the latch, not y, will be equal to 0. And since the clock is still equal to 1, that 0 will appear here at the input of the latch. And again, the state of the latch will be updated. And this time, it will go back to 0. And as far as the clock is equal to 1, this change of the state will continue to happen. And you can see that y will be equal to 0, 1, then 0, 1, 0, 1, as far as the clock is equal to 1. And this is not a desired behavior from that we, we expect from the ledger, from a storage element. We want to have this change of value happening only once during a clock pulse. 
not more than that. So we have seen that as long as c is equal to 1, the value of y continues to change. The changes are based on the delay present on the loops through the connection from y back to y. So inside the rest, you know that there are the gates, NAND gates or NOR gates, and they, they have delays. That's why for a given amount of time, y stays as 1, and then for some more time, it becomes equal to 0 and 1, so it alternates. And as I already mentioned, this behavior is not acceptable. We want to have the output changes only once per clock pass. And the clock pass is this. So this is one clock pass in it. So during this time, we want to have only a single change. Therefore, we need to kind of modify the current design that we have here. And what we will end up with will be called as the Philip fill up. So Philip fill ups are designed so that the outputs will not change within a single clock pass. They will the outputs or the state of the system will change only once per clock pass. Let's see how it could be done. One solution to solve the latch timing problem is to break the closed pass from y to y within the storage element. So instead of, uh, indeed we are going to break that direct connection from the output into the data input. The commonly used pass breaking solution replaces the clocked delash. So instead of the clocked delash that we had in the previous slide, we will have an edge triggered Philip fill up. But let's see how this edge triggered Philip fill up could be constructed. This HTGERT flip flop will ignore the pulse while it is at a constant level and it will trigger only during a transition of the clock's signal. So if we have the clock here, the changes will happen only at the rising edge, which is a transition. Yeah? So the changes will happen only at this rising edge of the clock or or maybe in the at the falling edge of the clock not during the time in which the clock is equal to one or zero and here we will see how they could be uh, constructed instead of using a single clocked uh, delatch here we have two of them one after the other one the second one receives the data input from the output of the first one. The first one receives the clock signal directly and the second one receives it with an inverter in between. C or the control or the clock here, here is a clock pulse which alternates between 0 and 1 and you can see it here with fixed frequency or with fixed period. When C is equal to 1, so if we say here, when C is equal to 1, when C is equal to 1, we can see that the master latch, this is the master one, and this is the slave one. When C is equal to 1, the master latch will be on. And the slave one will be off because when c is equal to 1, we will have 1 here and we will have 0 here. And we know that as far as the, as long as this, the clock c input of the latch is equal to 0, its output will not be updated. Therefore, in this case, the new d input, the new d input here, will be written into the master latch. So if d changes, whatever value we have, either 0 or 1, it will be written into the master one. But for the slave one, the previous value will remain there. So it will not be updated. On the other hand, when c becomes equal to 0, if we have c equal to 0, here we will have c equal to 1 for the slave one. For the master, now, since the clock input is equal to 0, the output of it, Q, will not be updated. 
I can call it Q1. And for the slave one, since clock is equal to 1, its output will follow the input. So Q will be equal to D, whatever value we have there. But since D is connected to the output of the master latch, it will take the last value that we had there. So in this way, indeed, the, the last val the, the value that we had in the data input of the overall circuit here will be written into the the, the slave latching. Let me show you how it, it works then by referring to the to the clock here. So during the time in which the clock is equal to one, we are here, let's say. If the value of D changes, if it goes from 0 to 1, or if it goes from 1 to 0, or in any other way, at this moment, at the moment in which the clock is going from 1 to 0, the value of D will be written into Q of the master. So this is master. Again, okay, and this is a slave. And during this time, we don't have any, let's say, connection between the output of the slave and its input because the clock is equal to zero. So Q will hold its, the slave one will hold its previous value. So if, let's say, at the moment before changing the, the clock from one to zero, if D was equal to zero, then this zero will be written into the master latch. If it was equal to one, if D was equal to one, it will be written into the master as well. And after that, in the during the time in which the clock is equal to zero, when clock becomes equal to zero, here we'll have one. And therefore, whatever value we have for D, which comes from the, the master in the latch, will be written into the slave. But now there will be no connection between the data input and the output of the first latch, because C or clock is equal to zero. So it will hold the last value that we had at this moment. And therefore, the overall uh, system here will take the input value at the falling edge of the clock and until next falling edge of the clock it will hold its it, it will hold that value there will be no change in it you can see when the clock is equal to zero so we have zero here we have one here and therefore whatever value we have here will be written into the slave latch but for the master there even if the value of D changes, nothing will happen. Its output will remain the same as before. And in this way, we have constructed a flip-flop indeed, which is sensitive to the falling edge of the clock. So at each, at each falling edge of the clock, if we have any value here at this moment, it will be written into the flip-flop. And then until the next falling edge, it will hold that value. So we now have a D-type flip-flop, and this D-type flip-flop is shown with this symbol. While previously we had the D-type latch, and that D-type latch was shown with this symbol. So you can see the differences between the symbols as well. Yeah? For the flip-flop, we have this triangle here. And that triangle means that the storage element is sensitive to the edge of the clock, not to the level of the clock. Here you can see the, the timing diagram for the flip fill-up and the latch, both of them are D-type. We have the clock input, we have the D or data input, and the output of the latch and the flip fill-up. Initially, D is equal to zero. At the rising edge of the clock, when clock goes from 0 to 1, the output of both latch and the flip-flop switch to 0. 
whether they were already zero or they were one, now they switch to zero. Then at the at this moment D switches from zero to one. You can see that for the latch, its output switches to one as well because the clock is still equal to one. But for the flip flop, it remains there because it will not change until the next rising edge of the clock. Here, the flip flop is sensitive to the rising edge of the clock, and only at that point, the flip flop will check the input. It is equal to one, therefore, it will switch to one its output, and later, when the data switches back to zero here yeah. the latch will switch back to zero because the clock is equal to one but for the flip flop it will remain at one so the changes for the flip flip flop will happen only at the rising edge of the clock here we have the positive edge triggered d type flip flop it could be constructed using the clocked D latches in the way which is shown here. So there are two D type latches, clocked latches with two inverters. We have the positive edge triggered D type fill fill up. Alternatively, if we remove if we remove this inverter here, we will have the falling edge triggered D type fill fill up. And again, Q changes to the value on D at the input side D applied at the positive clock edge within timing constraints to be specified. This type of flip fill up, the positive edge triggered D D type flip fill up will be our standard flip fill up for most of the sequential circuits that we are going to study and design. For the flip fill ups, we also have some direct inputs. In order to set the flip fill up or reset the flip fill up at power up or at reset, all or part of a sequential circuit usually is initialized to a known state before it begins operation. And in order to do that, there will be direct inputs. As you can see here, we have the D type flip fill up, which is sensitive to the negative edge of the clock. We have the set input and reset input, which will be used at the beginning, at the initialization. So this initialization will be done usually outside of the clocked behavior of the circuit. So it will be done asynchronously. We will have direct R and or S inputs, which control the state of the latches. Within the flip fill ups, these are used in order to do the initialization. So for example, for the one which is shown here, if we apply zero to not R, the flip fill up will be reset to zero. If we apply zero to the not S, the flip fill up will be set to one, and then it will start from that point. All right, so here we have an example of using the positive edge trigger D type flip flops in order to simulate a traffic light controller. Three D type flip flops are used here. They are sensitive to the rising edge, as you can see here. And we have interconnection of the output of the first flip flop to the input of the third one. Output of the second one is connected to the input of the first one, and output of the third one is connected to the input of the second one. Initially, we start with the red light turned on, so R is equal to 1 at the beginning, Y is equal to 0, and G is equal to 0. Now, next time that we have a rising edge of the clock, let's say it happens here, we will check the input to the flip flops, and their out, uh, output or state will be updated based on that. So you can see that the input to the first flip flop is zero, to the second one is zero, and to the third one is equal to one. So at the rising edge of the clock, the first one will switch back to zero, the second one will remain at zero, and the third one will switch back to one. And they will remain like this 
until the next rising edge of the clock. So they will keep their values. At the next rising edge of the clock, again we need to check the current input to the Philip Phillips. So we have now R is equal to 0, Y is equal to 0, and G is equal to 1. So if we check the inputs, the input to the third one now is 0, the second one is 1, and to the first one is 0. And therefore, the state of the Philip Phillips will be updated accordingly. The first one will remain at 0, the second one will switch to 1, and the third one will switch to 0. And they will remain like this, again, until the next rising edge of the clock. And the next rising edge of the clock, we need to check the inputs of the Philip Phillips. Let's do it again. So R is equal to 0 before the rising edge of the clock. Y is equal to 1 and G is equal to 0. If you check the input to the Philip Phillips, here we have 0. For Y we have 0 and for R we have 1. Therefore, the output of the Philip Phillips will be updated like this. And again, this will be the case until the next rising edge of the clock. And you, you can see that this will be done in, in the form of a second. So it will have the red light turned on and then it will turn off. Green one will turn on, it will turn off. Yellow one will turn on and this will continue in the form of a sequence. So for this example, you can see that each traffic light, green, red, or yellow, will be turned on for only for one clock pulse duration, which might not be enough in the practical case, but later we will learn how to do it, how to specify a duration for each state to be on or off. That will be done in the next lectures. Alright, so I think that's all for this video and for this lecture. You can go through this. I already have explained this to you. I hope you have uh, enjoyed the video lecture. You have learned how the Philip Phillips are constructed in a simple way, how they behave, and how they could be used in order to implement a sequential circuit. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video later. And bye for now.